invite you to turn your Bibles to, to Romans chapter 1. And while you're doing that, let me also just, uh, I meant to say this earlier, is uh, uh, the, the final figure I, I received from the, from the Lottie Moon Christmas offering was uh, $2,450. Does that sound right? Okay. $2,450. So we praise, praise God for, for your, your giving to that and, um, and just giving overall this, this past year. So the Lord has truly, truly blessed us. Very, very thankful. So Romans, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 7. Let's read. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, as we begin this message this morning, as we begin this study, Father, we ask your blessings on us, that it would be fruitful uh, for us and, and our, our, our growth. And, um, and most of all, as is mentioned in this passage, to, for your glory, Father. So bless us now. We commit this to you and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In Martin Luther's preface to his commentary on the book of Romans, he says this, This letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while, not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. It is in itself a bright light, almost bright enough to illumine the entire Scripture. That is from Martin Luther. And so, if the book of Romans is the most important piece in the New Testament and the purest gospel, you may be wondering today why I have taken so long to get here. <laughs> of course, I've, I've been at this church since 2007, so why so long? Well, reality is I have gone through this book with our church uh, many years ago. Uh, it took us about three years, probably around 2011 to 2014. We went through it during our, our weekly prayer meetings, which, which used to be on, on Wednesday nights. And, uh, and so, uh, and I guess I bring this up just reflecting on it a little bit as the longer you're, you're at a church, you think about things, as, especially when you kind of come around and teach a book again. And uh, I just thought about how different of a church we were uh, the first time I took the church through, the, I, I intentionally went through on Wednesday night so I could go slow, so I could allow people to ask questions, because again, we were a very different church at that time. Uh, uh, some of the things, some of the more mightier or more weightier manners, uh, matters of, of, of the scriptures, of the book of Romans, uh, you know, was, was hard for some people to, to take. Uh, it was doctrines they had never heard before, and so I wanted to take it slow and and uh, so that's, that's, that's what we did. So, so uh, we, 
Times have changed, but I'm thankful for what God has done in our church. And I'm grateful to be starting a fresh study of, of this book. And I still feel just as inadequate to teach it as I did 10 years ago. And I'm sure I won't hit on everything uh, that uh, you might see in the text or, or you might have questions that I don't answer. So please always feel free to come to me after the service uh, and, and to share whatever thought, question you have. Uh, I'll be glad to, to hear from you. I always enjoy getting questions from you. And remember, we still have our 15-minute sermon uh, review on uh, Sunday nights where you can uh, ask questions there as, as well. So we won't have it tonight, of course, but starting back next, next Sunday. Anyway, let's, let's jump in. The, the, the basic context of the writing of this book is that Paul is wrapping up his third missionary journey. He's most likely in the city of Corinth uh, when he writes the book of Romans. And his plan is to first return to Jerusalem. Uh, the church there had fallen on hard times due to a famine that had hit that area. And some of the churches Paul had planted had taken up money uh, for the, uh, the mother church, if you will, there in Jerusalem. And so Paul was planning to take the gifts to Jerusalem personally himself. And then his plan, as he points out in this letter, is to, is to visit Rome next after he's visited Jerusalem to go to Rome in order to minister to them. But he also hopes to go from Rome on to Spain because the gospel had not been preached there yet in Spain. And Paul says in Romans 15 that it is, is his aim to preach where the gospel has not been preached yet. And so his hope is that through his teaching and interaction with the church in Rome, they would be inspired to support him in this work uh, to Spain. Yet in writing Romans, another factor is that as, we, as far as we know, the church in Rome was not started by an apostle. Uh, the, that being one of the 12 uh, plus Paul or Essentially, you could, you know, some people say maybe James, Barnabas were apostles, but, but at least the, the 12 and, and Paul. Uh, so it's believed that a church was started by others, perhaps some who were present at Pentecost in Acts 2, as, as uh, Jews from Rome were mentioned there in Acts 2 as being there at Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit uh, came upon the church for the first time. And three thousand, the, 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 the apostles stood up and preached, and, and three thousand were miraculously saved that day. Uh, so it's believed that maybe out of that uh, group, um, some some new converts took the gospel back to to Rome. We're just we're just not sure. And so for that reason, it's believed that Paul sees the need to to lay out a thorough presentation of the gospel to correct any wrong understandings and then inspire them to partner with him in taking the gospel to others. And so Paul begins his letter like he always does, and like any ancient letter uh, would typically begin at that time, uh, with saying first who it is that sent this letter, who it is that's supposed to receive this letter, and then a, a greeting. And where the greetings of ancient letters were extremely brief, I mean just sender, responder, uh, sender, receiver, and, and, and greeting. Paul and his letters were typically a few more words, one to three verses perhaps. But here in Romans, because of some of the things I just mentioned, the greeting is much longer. Paul has a lot to say, and he begins by introducing much of it in the greeting. And so we see three emphases here. Paul, and, and those three are Paul's authority, Paul's gospel, and Paul's desire to encourage the Roman church. That is, that is uh, the three points for us here this morning. This is a greeting, opening up the letter, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. And in that, he wants to emphasize his authority, his gospel, and his desire to encourage the church in Rome. So let's begin with his authority in verses 1 and 2. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So Paul begins by referring to himself, 
uh, as a servant of Christ Jesus. It certainly sounds like a humble way to refer to yourself. The word servant is, uh, in, is the, the original word in, in the Greek is doulos. It literally means slave. So Paul is saying that he is a slave to Christ Jesus. In other words, Christ owns him. He ransomed Paul with his own blood. And so that's how we should all really see ourselves as slaves of Christ. That's not, that's not an oppressive thing because Paul says in Romans 6 that we are either a slave of sin or we are a slave to Christ. Those are literally the only two options. We either choose Christ and follow him as our Lord and Savior or we live under the oppression, the slavery of sin. Those are our two options. But there's, a, there's, a, there's reason to think that Paul uses that term for another reason as well. In the Old Testament, those who were prophets and held positions of leadership like Moses, Joshua, David, and others, they were often called servants of the Lord. At the deaths of both Moses and Joshua in Deuteronomy 34 and Joshua 24, they were referred to as servants of the Lord. The Lord refers to David as his servant in 2 Samuel 7 when he makes his covenant with him. And so for, for Paul to refer to himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, it communicated first that Christ Jesus was Lord because he didn't say Paul is, is a slave to the Lord or servant of the Lord. He said Paul is a servant of, of, of Christ Jesus. So he's really simply de he's declaring Jesus as Lord there. But also, secondly, Paul now, he's, he's saying that Paul holds an office of great authority as those great men in the Old Testament. And that office is then further explained in the next clause, called to be an apostle. Now, the word generally means messenger or sent one and can refer to someone who is simply a missionary. But primarily in the New Testament, apostle refers to the special office of those whose qualifications are that they had been with the Lord in his earthly ministry, according to Acts 1, or had seen him risen from the dead and were specifically appointed by Jesus to be an apostle. It was a special office with, a, with special authority. They were the ones that Jesus trusted with the teaching of the gospel in the early years. Not only teaching, but also guarding the truth of the gospel. So that's why it says next that Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. That was the main purpose of the apostles, to testify to what they had seen and heard about Jesus. They took the baton from Jesus. He showed the gospel in his life, death, and resurrection. And they were to then witness to the world about what they had seen. And so Paul, for Paul to declare himself as an apostle was to claim great authority that he expected the church to submit to. But then it's important to add that what Paul preaches is not ultimately anything new and rests on the authority of the scriptures that came before. It says at the end of verse 1 that the gospel of God, quote, was promised beforehand through his prophets, God's prophets in the holy scriptures. So in reality, the gospel of God is found all the way back to the beginning of Genesis in the Garden of Eden when the Lord promised that from the offspring of the woman would come one who would crush Satan's head and the oppression he had brought with sin. And so the whole Old Testament then is a gradual revealing from, from Genesis 3. It is a gradual revealing of how God would fulfill his promises to, to save us from his promise to Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed in Genesis 12, to his promise to David that his son would be king forever in 1 Samuel 7. So what Paul is saying here is that everything he presents here is straight out of God's word in the Old Testament and that he's been given a special office as apostle to proclaim to them the fulfillment of God's promises from the Old Testament. As it says at the beginning of verse 3, concerning God's son. And so, as, as Paul is introducing 
his authority here to the Roman church and essentially saying, you need to heed these words. Folks, it is the same for us nearly 2,000 years later. The book of Romans is the word of God. It, it, it has the exact same authority as if God were standing here physically and saying it to us. God inspired the apostles and close associates of the apostles to write their accounts of what they had seen and, and, and the letters to the churches that they planted and ministered to as a way of preserving a written record as a witness to us. And so I hope we take Paul's words as seriously as he intended the Roman church to take them. These are the words of life. To believe the book of Romans would mean eternal life and salvation from God's judgment. And it would mean death and eternal judgment for those who don't. We are to see the word of God as the highest authority over our hearts and lives. And so having said that, and considering we have just started a new year, how many of you have committed to a daily reading of the Bible in this coming year? No, no I don't need a show of hands. I'm not trying to, to put any pressure on anyone. But folks, the Word of God is supposed to be the authority in our lives. And the only way it can exercise that authority is if we are in the Word of God, reading it so that we know it, so that we can follow it, you see. And so, are we serious? Have you challenged yourself this coming year to read the Bible each day? You are flooded every day with messages from the world. And you need to start your day every day in the Word to be reminded of who you are in Christ and what He has called us to do. You can, you can read at your own pace. Uh, for, for many years now, I've, I've, I've uh, read through the Bible, the whole Bible in a year, and I just said, you know what, I'm not doing that this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a two-year plan, okay, where uh, you, I can read slower and, and meditate more on each passage that I read, and eventually still, though, get through the Bible through the whole Bible. And so it comes out to be about a, a chapter and a half per day or 50 chapters in a month uh, to, to complete it in, in two years. I'm alternating between the Old Testament and New Testament. But, but folks, some plan, what, whatever, whatever works is that you get in the Word and read it daily and, 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 and chew on it. Uh, it, was, it was funny, last week uh, we, we decided to um, visit uh, Christ Covenant Church in Matthew's uh, 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 Kevin DeYoung is, of course, the pastor there, and uh, he was giving a, he was calling his church to, um, to, to uh, commit to reading the, reading the Bible daily, and, uh, and he, he used a comparison. He said, uh, read, read it like, like a cow and not like a cat, and he talked about, I could so relate to this, he talks about you, you open up a can of food for a cat, and he's just like devours it, you know? I remember our, 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 our old cat, Berkeley, uh, we had Berkeley and Harper, and Berkeley would just push Harper out of the way and get to the food and just eat it, eat it up. And then he said, but he said, instead, chew it like a cow. You know, a cow is just like, you know, on and on and on. That's what we need to do, folks, is to be feasting, feeding on the Word, meditating on it so it soaks into our hearts so that by the Spirit of God it changes us. Let's commit to that this coming year. If, if, if we did nothing else, if we, if we improved on nothing else in this church, if, we, if everyone in this church was reading the Bible daily, whew, revival, revival. If we were reading and meditating on the Word daily, revival. So anyway, so that's our, that's our first point, the authority. The authority that Paul is, is demonstrating or expressing to the church, the authority of the Word of God, that they are to heed and, and, uh, and, and follow what he is, he is saying to them. That brings us then to verses 3 through 5. It says, Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship 
to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. So I know there's a lot there. Uh, but So the first thing to point out, though, is simply that the gospel is about a person. The gospel is about a person. According to the first three words there of verse 3, the gospel of God that Paul was set apart for in verse 1 that was promised beforehand in the Holy Scriptures is concerning God's Son. The gospel is about Jesus Christ and what was accomplished for us through him. We we are talking about the exclusivity of Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. There is no way, no other way a person could be saved but through Jesus Christ. So what did God's eternal son accomplish for us that brought us this good news of the gospel? Well, first... He became one of us, right? We see that in the next part of verse 3. It says, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Now, key to the gospel is that Jesus became a man. The divine Son of God took on flesh so that he could represent us in his death. He acted as a substitute. He took the punishment that we deserved for our sin. So he had to become fully human to do that. So we certainly will see this more in chapters 3 through 5 of of Romans. Yet key to the promises of the Old Testament is the promise of a Messiah, a king born from the line of David who would deliver his people and establish a kingdom of righteousness and peace that he would reign reign over forever. And that is what we see Paul emphasize in Romans, that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament promises. So what verse 3 is really emphasizing is that the Son of God became a man in order to be our Messiah. Yet to fully understand verse 3, we have to understand understand it in light of verse 4. There are some interesting parallels and contrasts between the two verses. So look there so I I can show you. Look there at your text, verses 3 and 4. So first, it it says concerning his son at the beginning of verse 3. But then at the end of verse 4, it says, Jesus Christ our Lord. So they kind of serve as bookends to the rest of verses 3 and 4. He introduces the son concerning his son, but then proclaims him who he is, Jesus Christ our Lord. So those, 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 those uh, work as bookends for verses 3 and 4. And there you see other contrast. Uh, so first, uh, in verse 3, it says he was descended. And that was, that's compared to, in verse 4, that he, uh, to, to, to declare. He was declared. Uh, verse 3, from David. And then verse 4, to be the Son of God. In verse 3, according to the flesh. And then in verse 4, according to the spirit of holiness. So in other words, there is a a big contrast between verses 3 and 4. So the the question is, what is the contrast? So in verse 3, you have Paul affirming the Son of God, that the Son of God was descended from David according to the flesh. So that is fulfilled. But, what, but what, what do we know? What do we know about David and all the kings that descended from him according to the flesh? What do we know about David and all the kings that descended from him according to the flesh? They struggled with sin. They struggled in weakness. And for Paul, he usually refers to the flesh. When you see him mention the flesh, he usually mentions it in regards to sin and weakness. Okay? He even refers to Jesus in Romans 8, 3 as being born in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not sinful, for sure, not sinful, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. Essentially, in the age of sin and weakness. And so that is contrasted then to verse 4, where Jesus is declared, or better translation, appointed to be the Son of God in power, according to to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So Jesus was first descended from David according to the flesh, but then appointed to be the son of God in power. And if you think about it, even though Jesus did many miracles and signs and and could draw a crowd, 
his effect on the world was minimal during his earthly ministry. Even his own disciples struggled to understand him and, 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 and turn from their old ways of thinking. One, one even betrayed him. Another denied him. All of them deserted him. And he died a criminal on a cross. This doesn't reflect on his abilities whatsoever. He was God, no doubt. But it did reflect on what still needed to be accomplished. What still needed to be accomplished. And so what happens? What was accomplished? The third day. The third day. Jesus rises from the dead. Romans 8, 11 says it was the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, the spirit of holiness as we see here. And, and at that point, everything changed. Christ's resurrection showed first that he wasn't a criminal, that he wasn't a sinner. Instead, it showed that he was righteous and had died in the place of other sinners, us, all who believe in him, his elect. And he had taken the punishment for our sin. And the resurrection showed that God the Father had accepted his son's sacrifice for sinners and had raised his son from the dead through the Spirit to vindicate him. And in fulfillment of another Old Testament promise, Psalm 2, verse 7, by raising Jesus from the dead, God the Father anoints and declares Jesus king. King. Turn with me real quick over to to Psalm 2. It's in the middle of your Bible, so just close your Bible and open up at the middle and then work your way from there. Psalm 2. I want to read verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You see folks, this is a psalm about the reign of the Messiah. In verse verse 7, we we just read the psalm, is about God anointing the Messiah king. And the reference to God's son is, actually goes back to how the Old Testament first spoke of Israel. If you remember, you go back to Exodus, Exodus 4, and, and, and God, God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let his, he said, Israel, his son, to let his son Israel go. That's how God referred to, to the nation of Israel. And then later on, with the establishment of kings, in Israel, they were referred, the, the kings were referred to as sons of God because they embodied and represented the people of Israel. And so when a son of David was anointed king, he would be declared not just king, but the son of God. So the reference to son of God in verse 4 here in Romans 1 is not so much about Jesus' divinity. He was certainly divine, no doubt. But the emphasis here particularly is his, on his messiahship. Paul is saying in verse 4 that Jesus' anointing by the Father as king and therefore son of God occurred at his resurrection. And we see Paul do the same thing in Acts 13 when he's preaching the gospel there. uh, Referring back to Psalm 2 verse 7 and that anointing of the Messiah. So Jesus is to be declared the son of God, or for Jesus to be declared here in, in, in Romans 1 to be the son of God is not really about his deity He was already the divine son of God, but more specifically, his messiahship. Tom Schreiner sums it up like this. While Jesus was on earth, he was the messiah and the son of God, but his death and resurrection inaugurated a stage in his messianic existence that was not formally his. Now he reigns in heaven as Lord and Christ. That's why verse 4 ends with, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The pronouncement of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He had accomplished the work and been declared by God, the, the, the Messiah. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, and so let me, let me sum this up. Uh, 
So we have now gone from an age of weakness where man is condemned and under the power of sin to an age of power accomplished by the death and resurrection of of Jesus Christ. And in his resurrection, he has been anointed king and established a new kingdom, a kingdom with power, a kingdom that forgive and, and, the, and the kingdom that forgives sins and changes lives and empowers to live for him. So that's why then in verse 5 it says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Paul's apostleship that he declared earlier was given to him by God's grace in Christ for the purpose of him and the other apostles to lead the effort of bringing about the obedience of faith for Christ's glory among all the nations. It's no longer for the weak and oppressed Jews alone. No, it's for all nations, powerfully led by King Jesus for his glory to bring about the obedience of faith. That's Paul's gospel. So what does the obedience of faith mean? Well, it means two things, really. In one sense, faith is a command. We are commanded to believe. When the jailer asked Paul what he must do to be saved, Paul commanded him to believe, to put his faith in Jesus Christ. But the obedience of faith also means that real faith, real saving faith, is always accompanied by obedience. Not perfect obedience, but obedience. The gospel is not about just getting us a free ticket to heaven. It is about a people. The gospel is about a people being restored to God who live by faith. And and by that faith, by trusting him, they obey him. That is what God intended when he created the world. And so even though the book of Romans is very much a book about how we are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, it is also a book about how that faith leads to obedience. And and, and both that faith and that obedience is provided by our Savior and Lord who reigns in power. Paul's gospel that he is writing to the Romans about, is about Jesus saving a people for himself who live not according to the weakness of the flesh, but who live by faith in Jesus Christ through his life-giving power of grace. So folks, are you living in that reality? Christ took your sin in his death. And in his resurrection, he gave you life. You were born depraved. But you have been raised in Christ, sanctified, to live for his glory. To live by faith. Trusting your salvation, your future, your daily decisions to him. So Paul is saying in Romans that if you are in Christ, this is who you are in Christ. Therefore, trust him and obey. Again, we were born in weakness. We were born in sin. Christ came in in the likeness of sinful flesh in this dark world died for us to cover our sin. And then he rose from the dead in power. And for all in Christ, that power is for us. That is tra- it transforms us. It's, it's what gives us grace. To, it gives us the power to believe. It changes our hearts so we, we believe. And it, it gives us the grace to obey him out of that faith. We, we, we put our trust in Christ by his grace, and, we, and, we, and, and by faith, we, we obey him, walking with him daily. This is Paul's gospel. So maybe over the next, as I thought about this, how this could be applicable, I thought, here we are starting to study. 
maybe I could challenge you over, over the next week. If you could write a list of things that you know you're struggling with in your faith and obedience. Things you're worrying about. Things uh, you just, you don't trust God with. Um, things you're just clearly being disobedient about. Or struggling to be obedient about. Or, or you just flat know you're, you're just not, you've, 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 you're completely rebelling against God on that issue. Write that list down. And then tuck it in your Bible. As we go through this study, I challenge you to take that list out and see how that passage is applying to your struggles, your, 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 your weaknesses, your struggles to believe in those particular areas of your life. See how the gospel applies to these, to these things. Because, folks, Jesus is our Savior and Lord and King. And he has given us power to live for him. That is what he has called us to do, to trust him and obey. That brings us then to our final point in verses 6 and 7. Paul said he has received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among the nations. And then he says, including you who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see in the next section, Paul expressed his desire to come to them in Rome in order to encourage them in the gospel. And this letter is certainly for that purpose as well, and we see that intent even here in this, this uh, greeting. What beautiful words who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. We all need to belong, don't we? We all have this need to belong. Some churches use it as a way to draw people to, to their churches. You see signs in front of churches saying, you belong here. It's an interesting debate for lunch later on. But Paul says it more profoundly. To belong to Jesus Christ. To belong to Jesus Christ. Now, how does that come to be? Paul will show us here in Romans, throughout Romans, it is by grace alone. The word called there, called to belong, the word called there means more than just encouraged to do something. It's the same word used in, uh, by Paul in verse 1 about his own calling. And it's the same word used in Romans 8 verse 30 when he says that those whom God predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. In other words, everyone who gets predestined gets called. Everyone who gets called gets justified. Everyone who gets justified gets glorified which is our eternal state of, of salvation. So in other words, this calling that Paul is talking about, even to the church in Rome here in verse 6 and 7, is, is, is we, we call it an effectual calling. An effectual calling, come, coming from the word effect. Because it's a calling from God that supernaturally draws someone to him for salvation. It is a sovereign calling that works 100% of the time. If God calls with this effectual calling, a person comes to him in repentance and faith. And it, and it comes from God setting his love on a particular sinner and drawing him to him. And so then verse 7, it says, it's very much repetitive to verse 6. To those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. It's out of God's love that he effectually calls us and makes us saints, which means we, of course, then set apart for God. So Paul is encouraging them, the church here, in his opening words, his greeting, by reminding them of the great love that has been given to them in Christ. Paul is saying that God chose them, 
and pulled them out of their sin and made them his. His. He was, he's reminding them that it is all of grace. And he's saying, by faith in that amazing grace, live as saints. Live as saints. Do you realize you, you are that, right? If you are in Christ, you are a saint. We don't typically throw that word around, do we? But the word basically means, this is, means set apart. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means, though, that you've been, you've been set apart by God's grace. You have been set apart for him, to live for him, to be his, his child. That's who you are. That's you, you, how you are to live. Live as set apart for God alone, for Christ alone. So my prayer is that during this study, we will submit to the authority of the author of this book, to, to the Word of God, and that we will come to treasure Jesus Christ who has loved us and we will treasure his gospel that has saved us. And by a greater knowledge of his love, we will, we will be encouraged to set our lives apart from the rest of the world to live for his glory. For his glory. I'm sure you have your New Year's resolutions. Along with reading your Bible more, I trust let it be to know and trust and rest in his grace and love more. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel of Romans. Thank you for, for how you powerfully saved Paul, called him to, this, to be an apostle. Thank you for preserving his writing, inspiring him to write. And preserving it for us. And thank you for this opportunity uh, to, to study it together. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, born in the likeness of man, descended from David, lived a perfect life in our place, and died the death that we deserved in our place. He bore our sins. And then he rose from the dead in power, vindicated, anointed, King, Messiah, Savior, Lord. We turn to for forgiveness and eternal life and even a fruitful life that the power that raised him from the dead works in us spirit dwelling us, changing us, conforming us to your son, to live for you, to, to be set apart from this world. Father, help us through this study not to use the gospel as an excuse for sin, but a way to conquer sin, to believe in your promises that we are not only forgiven, but empowered to live for you. So bless us in these coming weeks and months. I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know you as Savior, that through this study they will come to know you as Savior. And see that the only way to be righteous is being credited with the righteousness of Christ. Through faith in him. And again, that your church would be sanctified, grow in, in, in our 
and our knowledge of you, our, your love for us, and we would be transformed, Father. So bless us. We commit all this to you and pray it in Christ's name. Amen.